All right, great announcements. Bless the Lord. Hey, one thing that I just wanted to re-highlight, I wanted to just give it a little extra push um, uh, over what uh, Sarah Jane mentioned in the announcements. The Scripps fundraiser, um, I, know, I know how it is here because I've, I've done kind of script fundraisers before, and they started a little bit slow, and then they gained momentum as people kind of figured out what was going on. But you know what? Last night, sitting at the kitchen table, uh, Michelle and I were looking over the list of the companies that participate in this fundraiser, and there was dozens. I wouldn't say there was hundreds. There were dozens, and so many places where we always shop. So why wouldn't we buy, for the same price, buy the gift card um, from Wendy back there and use that at places we're already going to be going to, like Quick Trip, for instance, where I buy all my gas, like Cub Foods, for instance, where I buy all my food. And uh, Quick Trip said that, hey, if you uh, buy one of these script cards, we'd be happy if you buy a $100 card, we're glad to give $4 to your church. Uh, if you buy two of them, we're glad to give $8 to your church. This is an easy way for you not to spend any extra money and still take advantage of the sales at those stores. It, it doesn't matter. You could do whatever you want to, to save money that way. But it's, it's just like cash. But money goes back into the work of God. That's the main thing. So think about doing this. It's just such a great, easy, easy, easy opportunity to bless the kingdom of God. And we're uh, keeping an eye towards missions with this fundraiser. It's all about missions. A, uh, a presumed future missions trip, uh, money to our missionaries, the whole thing. Okay, end, end of uh, extra announcement. Bless the Lord. So greetings. Welcome to Stone Bridge Church this morning. Uh, I'm speaking this morning because Pastor Kurt, as uh, he announced last week, he's down with uh, Pastor Chad and Sister Rachel at Return Church. And, uh, and actually, Pastor Kurt is preaching at Return Church this morning, and he took place in the installation service. We're so happy for uh, Chad and Rachel. We're so glad for the time that they were with us. They, they are two of our favorite people now, I'll tell you what, and they are so bounded to our congregation, I feel like they're part of Stonebridge Church forever, but, uh, but God had a calling for them to lead this church at Return Church, and I'm excited. So he, uh, you know, it's not like it was any surprise, he knew going in that, that there was going to be a, a short break-in period, then he was going to be installed as uh, the lead and senior pastor, and that just happened this weekend, so... Uh, we pray blessings, uh, we, uh, we pray favor, uh, we, we pray uh, God's best on Return Church, Pastor Chad, Pastor Rachel, and we know that God's going to do some great things there, just like God's going to do some great things here. So this morning, a few weeks ago, I shared a talk about our confidence in Jesus Christ uh, as our Savior, uh, and in the saving work of Jesus Christ, the saving work of Jesus Christ, Jude one twenty four says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling. He is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. I mean, imagine that. That's, that's what the, the Bible says about God, that he's able to keep you from stumbling. And we're talking about confidence. Sometimes all we worry about is stumbling. And the Bible says that he's able to keep you from stumbling. He's able to present you faultless. God, I don't feel like I'm good enough. He's able to present you faultless, right? Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. In my personal experience, and this is what I mentioned when we preached before, in my personal experience... I have witnessed a lot of followers of Jesus who lack confidence in what Jesus has done for us. So that message, when we preached that, that was in September, late September, consider that, consider that side A of the message, right? We're talking about, about old LPs here. We're going vinyl today. That's side A of the record. Today, we're going to flip it over. I'm going to play side B 
You know how side B of a record usually goes? If you remember back to your records, side A had all the big splashy songs, and side B is a little bit more introspective and, and uh, artistic. I don't know if I'm going to get introspective or artistic today, but we're going to do our best, you know, but, but uh, we're going to go on to side B. There are reasons, I want to tell you, there are reasons when I was preaching side A that some of you should have come up and disagreed with me. You should have, you know, uh, when I preached that message. I'm going to help you today, all right, because I'm going to tell you what your disagreement should have been, then I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> How about that? How will that work? All right? So let's just look. These are the scriptures from side A because they're also part of side B. So I went to Hebrews 10, verse 35, and I read this. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, because you have need of endurance. So that after you have done, after, notice that, assuming that you have done, after you have done, we didn't skip to how you do it, we skipped right to you did do it. After you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And I said this last time, I said, there's a lot of stuff going on in a very short scripture, right? I mean, we have confidence, we have reward, we have endurance, we have the will of God, we have the promise. We got a six-week series in one or two verses. It's all there. The reward comes with confidence in Jesus, and you will have the ability to endure then you will do the will of God. And then you will see him in eternity one day, which is your reward. Okay? So that's the one in Hebrews. We also read in John 20, verse 31, it says, But these are written, these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. By the way, John... The Apostle John, he wrote a gospel, he wrote three separate letters, and then he capped it off by writing the book of Revelation, okay? So he's a prolific writer in the New Testament, and, uh, and he wrote a gospel that is really uh, quite different from the other, uh, most different of the four gospels, it really kind of is. But John says all this stuff. I wrote all this stuff. Scripture I just read was at the end of his gospel, pretty much the, the second to last chapter of his gospel. And he said, I wrote a bunch of stuff, guys. You know why I wrote it? You know why I wrote it? I wrote it that you might believe. I wrote it so you would believe that Jesus is the Christ. I didn't just write it as a history lesson. I wrote it so that you would believe. And by believing, you would have life in his name. That's why I wrote it. And then we went on, we ended in James 1, 4, and that kind of started the, uh, the, the, the title of all of our messages that we've had for the last six weeks. James 1, 4 says, let patience have its perfect work, perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So I'm very excited today to give you side B of the thought and... Uh, and I just want to continue on for a short time with the, the, the capstone message to perfect work. Perfect work. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. God, your word is so powerful. It's so great. Lord, I love your word. Lord, I love how uh, it doesn't matter what we read or how many times we read it. There is something new because your word is not a dead letter, oh God. Your word is living and alive. It's powerful. It's active. Lord, it even cuts to the dividing of soul and spirit. Lord, and I thank you. Lord, divide soul and spirit in this house this morning with your word. And God, speak to us in a powerful way. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You know, when I spoke before, and it's still appropriate to this message too, 
I revealed to you that uh, in life in general, and certainly in sports, I am what's known as a choker. I'm a choker. So in the, in the sports realm, a choker is somebody that, I mean, they are set up. They have the easiest deal to go, and they still mess it up. It's impossible for them to mess it up, and they still mess it up. Think of Gary Anderson uh, on the Minnesota Vikings kicking a whole season of perfect field goals. He gets to his last kick of the season, and it's a chip shot to send the Vikings to the Super Bowl. And what does he do? He goes wide right. It was impossible for a man who was perfect all year to miss that shot, and he did. That's what choking looks like. And I've done it so many times in sports, it's unbelievable. I couldn't even tell you all the stories. But I, I, I mean, I told a couple stories back in my, in my softball days, and, uh, and I, I reminded people that Dan, Dan, for a long time, Dan played a lot of positions. Dan was my first baseman when I was a pitcher, and it, it's only about 20 feet from the pitcher's mound to first base. And I had a lot of times where somebody would, would you know, hit a ball right up the middle. For some reason, I would accidentally field it, have it cleanly in my glove, and have all kinds of time. The batter hadn't even left the batter's box. And I could still throw the ball over Dan's head on a simple play to first base. I am famous for that. One thing that I remember, this is, this is always fun, when, uh, when we played in our league, our church league, Holy Man Church League in Bloomington, and uh, we had some big rivalries against other churches, other men of God. You know, I say that with air quotes, you know, but, but uh, other men of God and we're, we're playing. We had this one team and they were, they were like our main rivals, at least that year, over several years, actually. They had one guy on their team. He was a really good batter. Uh, he, he was, there's a lot of things I could say about him, but he was a really good batter. He could, he could hit anything just about anywhere. He couldn't hit it far, but he could, he could get base hits all the time. And he would come up. Now, I was a pitcher, right? He would come up. He'd get in the batter's box, and, and, and uh, he's supposed to be facing me. He's supposed to be ready to bat. And he would take the bat, and he'd put it on his shoulder, and he'd turn his head like this until I got a strike on him. And he'd keep his head turned. He wouldn't even look at me. And that was so disrespectful. I can't even tell you. You know, man of God, right. And I'll tell you, I, and so all I had to do then, all I had to do was throw a strike. I mean, it's, it's 30 feet. I just, I, I could throw strikes. I could, I could throw strikes between my legs. All I had to do was throw a strike, get a strike on him, and, uh, and, and make him look like a fool. And, uh, and no. I couldn't throw a strike. He would do that. I can't tell you how many times I walked that man. And he never looked at me once. And the team would look at me with a disappointed look like, can you really? You can't even make it up. How did you walk him again? And, uh, and this guy could get hits. He was really good. I remember one time I just, you know, I lost, I lost all sanctification. <laughs> I, I, I lost my mind a little bit. And he's standing in that box. And this is the one time I was able to put the ball right where I wanted. He's not looking at me. So I, so I tossed kind of a high pitch, and I dropped that thing right on the top of his bean. <laughs> Hit him in the head, boom, bounced off. I got a good look out of that one. I really did. I'm like, well, you were looking at me. I was trying to throw a strike. What could I say? But you know what? Just that, 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 that whole thing of choking, it's just, I, I, I won't even tell you what I did with the jar of pickles last night trying to make a sandwich. It, you know, if I didn't have my wife around, I'd be dangerous to myself. You know, it's, it's terrible. But, you know, some believers live their life in the same way, the way that I used to play sports or still do, you know. So sure that they are one move away from blowing a sure thing. You know, I know Jesus died for me, Gary. I know he forgave me. I know this. But you don't even know. I'm on some seriously shaky ground here, brother. You know, I'm not sure I can make it to the finish line without falling down. I'm not sure. Or even worse, I know Jesus saved me before. But 
I'm not sure he's still saving me now. Because you know what? There's a lot of years between when I got saved and now. And I've done a lot of stuff. I haven't been perfect. I've messed up. I've messed up when I knew I was messing up. You know? There's a lot of water under the bridge. So on side A, we talked about how people, they don't usually lose their confidence in Jesus like over a single event. Hebrews, Hebrews 10.35 tells us not to cast away our confidence. Don't cast it away. The Greek word that's being used there uh, for, for throw away or cast away, it's actually one single word. And the, the word, it has an active meaning and a passive meaning. The active meaning is like in the New Testament when Jesus came upon the blind guy. Blind Bartimaeus was his name. And, uh, and Jesus did not pass him by. And Jesus said, have him come over here. And blind Bartimaeus, being blind and wearing a jacket, he gets up, he takes his cloak off, and he throws it. I mean, that, that's a signal of his faith, I think. But he, he throws it. He casts it away. That is the active meaning that's being used in the Greek there. But there's also a passive meaning. And the passive meaning is like this. It's like a tree in the fall. And it's full of leaves. And then they start turning. And the leaves start to drop. Those of you that have to rake in your yard, we're always glad that the leaves don't all drop in one day. Some trees are faster than others, but in general, they drop over time. And they drop, and they drop, and they drop over time. That's the passive pictures. So the Bible is telling us one of the ways that we lose confidence, it's not just by saying, all right, that's it. I don't believe in Jesus anymore. He didn't save me. He didn't forgive me. You know, most people don't struggle like that. They, that's not how it happens. People struggle because their confidence, it leaks. It leaks. And it drops leaf by leaf. What causes this? Sometimes it's culture. Sometimes it's our surroundings. Sometimes it's circumstances or, or failings. Uh, sometimes it's weaknesses or challenges. It could be lots of stuff. But before you know it, leaf by leaf, suddenly you're a bare tree and you lack confidence in the saving grace of Jesus. See how that happens? The Bible says that's how we lose our confidence, little by little. I'm going to show you in a moment how you can minimize leaking confidence in Jesus. Because he says you're going to need confidence. It's going to help you to stand your ground. And the ground that you stand on is righteousness. It's the righteousness that he's given you. Um, it's the righteous, it's confidence in the finished work of Jesus. And then guess what? After you stand firm in your righteousness, you are going to do the will of God. You just are going to do the will of God. You're going to do the will of God is going to work all things together because the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. They're ordered. You expect it. They're ordered of the Lord. God expects it. Okay, so now here is the place where you let me off the hook last time. All right? Because if you've done your research... You studied scripture, you've been around church for a while, the teachings of Jesus. You're thinking to yourself, okay, all right, okay. Uh, hold on a second, Gary. You better read the whole chapter there, preacher. <laughs> read the whole chapter. You might be like, uh, I see how Gary did that. I see what he's doing. He started in verse 35. Great. Talking about how salvation, it's not about our performance. But he definitely didn't start reading in verse 26. Because verse 26 clearly says that it's all about our performance. I mean, Gary stood up there. He told us all about duckies and bunnies and skipped right over the scary parts. And unfortunately, I want to tell you, this is a feeling that the church has had over the centuries. 
Christians at first, they accept all that Jesus did for them. And it's like the man, it's it's it, like I say, uh, you know, quoting quoting mercy me. It's not good news. It's the best news ever. And we find we, we, we you know, we accept what Jesus did for us. Then we find passages that contradict this. And we say, see, mm -hmm. it's not that good. Not that good. It still hinges so much on my performance and what I do. And exhibit A, I mean, here we go. Are you ready for this? Buckle up your seatbelts. You know, just clip that thing in the buckle and pull it tight. We're going to go on a wild ride here. It's about to get intense. Here we go. Hebrews 10, starting at verse 26. Listen to this. It says, now, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. See? See, Gary? You better balance this out. But all that's left is a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses, they died without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more do you think the punishment will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. I mean, you're like, Gary, is that not true? Yeah, yeah actually it is. It is true. The Bible means it. What we read, the Bible means it. And then it goes on and says, well, we know, here's a line you've probably seen in a lot of movies, vengeance is mine and I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So I appreciate your grace message, Brother Gary, but you better include that stuff too. And you know what? That's how so many believers unravel the whole thing. I mean, man, it was so good until we got to that passage right there. And you know how many times we've done this as believers over the course of the centuries? And we're, we're just starting to accept what Jesus did for us. And then we find passages like this. And believers misappropriate the passage. They take it out of context. And they say, see, told you so. I'll tell you what, when I was a young Christian, so I got saved in my in my end of my high school year and uh, right away I went to Bible college I didn't know a thing about the Bible I didn't know anything you know I had I had maybe uh, four months close to five months of church services and and was madly learning as much as I could I didn't know anything I didn't know anything so I got into Bible college and I started learning stuff about the Bible and I remember one of the classes I had to take was the class on Hebrews which is where this scripture is and I got to tell you, the first time I read Hebrews 10 and 26, it scared me to death. It did. It totally did. Because I saw myself in that. I'm like, well, wow. Yeah, I've sinned since I got saved. Yeah, I've sinned. And I'm not sure that I've done it without planning on doing it sometimes. So that applies to me. You know, I, there's no hope. No hope for me. You know, Paul, Paul who wrote much in the New Testament, do you know what one of the criticisms that people had back in the day of Paul, his contemporaries? He writes at least half the New Testament. Do you know what the critics said? They said, Paul, your message is too good. It's too good. It's too good. I think preachers today should be criticized for being too good, too nice, too... Too caring, too easy. Hey, accept Jesus and you are forgiven. Nope, too good, too good. 
I mean, if you feel that way, you're in good company because that was a criticism of Paul. Paul was not criticized for like, wow, that was intense, Paul. Man, you're a hard preacher. That was a hard message, Brother Paul. Whoo, you know. No, it was exactly the opposite. Because you know what? Misappropriating and mischaracterizing passages like the one that we read, it, it, it's used to create fear. And you know what? To some extent, fear in the church, it works. A little bit. It really does. I mean, I'll tell you what, I've got fire insurance on my home. I don't know why I wouldn't want some fire insurance on my soul. So I, I, I could be talked into that, you know, a little fire insurance. I, I, don't, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be separated forever from God. Um, so I'm going to do what I got to do. You know, I'll be in church uh, and, and all that. I'll, I'll definitely do what I got to do. But that fear-based connection, it can motivate you. It can, it has, it's proven, it It really can. But that is not the goodness of God that will lead you to repentance, that will lead you to transformation, that will lead you to change. It doesn't, it's temporary. So let's just stop for a moment. Let me, forgive me, let me do a little history lesson here. who was the book of Hebrews written for? It was written for us. It's in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it was written, who was it written for? And, and, and at what time? Because research and study shows, and almost all the scholars agree, that that book was written for what was known as Messianic Jews. So that's Jews that got saved. Messianic Jews. They received Jesus. And they were living in Rome at the time. So in, think all the way back, almost to the beginning of uh, of our calendar, to A.D. 49, 49 A.D., right around there, there's a persecution that happens. And uh, and in verse 32, uh, the writer here says, I recall the former days. I think he's talking about A.D. 49. Those are the former days. Um, Where in Rome... The current Caesar, the current ruler, he started to notice that the Jews were changing. Something something going on here. The Jews are are changing. You know what was happening? The Jews were accepting the Messiah. They were becoming Christians. Um, And it's interesting to note that uh, historically, as best we could tell, when the Jewish people were living under the old way, of relating to God, we called that the Old Covenant, that everything was copacetic. Everything was fine. They were getting on just fine. They were good citizens. Everything was, everything was all good. There were no issues. There was, uh, there was no disturbance in the force for all you Star Wars geeks, you know. But when the Jews started accepting the living way, the one true God, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection, and the life, who was dead, buried, and rose again, and their lives started to show in their lifestyle. And they walked around, they had transformed hearts. They started to tell people in the streets about Jesus. People started to get saved. In in Rome, people started to get saved. And they stopped trying to earn it or deserve it. They just received it and believed it. And all of a sudden, Rome said, wait a minute, you are messing with our culture and our economy, so you're out of here, you're out. So the Messianic Jews at that time started being removed from Rome. And, and uh, even, even some Jews who didn't believe in the Messiah got caught up in that, and they got removed. But for the most part, from what we could tell, the primary target was Jews who had accepted Jesus. I promise you, I'm getting there, okay? Now, fast forward 20 years, AD 49 to AD 69, okay? Now, there's a second persecution that happens under uh, a guy that you probably heard of. His name is Nero, Nero Caesar. And in uh, AD 64, Rome had a big fire. It destroyed most of the city, okay? So, So Rome is devastated. Guess who Nero blames? He blames the Messianic Jews 
who have started making their way back into Rome. And he starts killing them. He starts beheading them. He starts feeding them to lions. He starts killing their babies. I mean, it's terrible and it's horrible. And the writer of Hebrews just talks so strongly about going back to the old way of relating to God. He's, he is specifically speaking to Messianic Jews, Jews that have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who know that Jesus is the Messiah, but for fear of the persecution that's happening and, and, and for fear of being kicked out of their favorite city, Rome, or being killed or having their family killed, they make a deliberate decision and they say, Jesus, I know you're right, I know you're true, but you are inconvenient for my lifestyle. Inconvenient. I'm going to go back to the old way. I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice, to, uh, uh, sacrifice animals again. And I believe that animal blood will cover my sin. Always seemed fine before. It's going to be fine now again. And I will connect with you through my own performance. That's what they did. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, are you serious? You've accepted Jesus as your Messiah. You know it's real. You know he's true. And you know that he's the only one that could save you. And you're going back to sacrificing animals? You know, going back to your own performance? If you do that, he says, you are bringing judgment on your head and you will become, notice the language here, you will become an adversary of God. Now, some churches have used portions of Scripture like this to tell believers, believers who, by the way, are doing their best to follow Jesus by the grace of God, help of the Holy Spirit, telling them, you know, they come to church and they say, hey, you better be careful. You better be careful. See that passage right there? Did you read that? If you deliberately turn, if you deliberately turn, you will become an adversary of God. That's going to happen to you. How bad do you think the punishment will be? Because you have profaned the spirit of grace by messing up. Folks, let me tell you something. That language, verse 26, verse 27, that is reserved for a specific, very select few to whom it applied. If you're sitting here today, like I was when I was in Bible college, and you're wondering, wow, does that scripture apply to me? If you could even ask that question, I promise you, it doesn't. It doesn't. If, you're, if, if you have deliberately turned your back on God, I think you'd know about it, you know? And furthermore, I don't think you'd care because you'd be desensitized. People who worry that they might have profaned the spirit, uh, that's not them. If they care, then that's not them. That doesn't apply to them. They are still alive to the things of God. I mean, look at this. It says that anyone who set aside the law of Moses, they'll die without mercy. How much more if you are setting aside the grace of Jesus? They're saying they were, Messianic Jews were saying, I reject you, Jesus. You're inconvenient. You're uncomfortable. I will sustain myself. I will save myself. I will go back to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, covenant and I'll fulfill the law on my own. That's, much as I know, that's nobody sitting here. Why is the author so passionate? Because he's saying, don't you dare go back. There's nothing back there. Folks, there's nothing back there. Uh, you know, furthermore, he says, you're going to need confidence. Don't throw it away because you're going to need some real endurance. Don't cast away confidence because it leads to endurance and you're going to need it. I mean, has 2020 not taught us how much we need some endurance? Serious. Look at the final verse of Hebrews chapter 10. Look at this. You want to talk about, about confidence. 
Here's how the chapter concludes. The writer says, hey, we're not those people. We're not those people. In case you were wondering, that's not who you are. I've got confidence that you are not those believers. Now I know who you are. He says, you are not those who shrink back and are destroyed. That's not you. That's not you. You are those who have faith and preserve their souls. Church, do you think that God saved you so that uh, you could have some devastating, terrible finish? You could miss the 25-year-old field goal at the end of the game? Do you think God saved you for that? Do you think God transformed you and changed your heart, set your life in a new trajectory just so that we could play some sadistic game with your life and, and see you crash and burn at the end? Has God taken us this far so that we'll just go back again to what we were before? You know, you're not going back. And furthermore, what's back there? What is back there? Nothing. It's hollow. It's empty. It's lifeless. No satisfaction. There's no fulfillment. He gives life. And that more abundantly. He does. I know who I am. I know who I am. You know who you are. I am saved. I am righteous. I am covered. I'm forgiven. I am loved. I'm accepted. And I am pleasing in his sight. That's the ground that I stand. That's the ground you stand on. My steps are established and ordered by the Lord. So where is that confidence in our lives? Where is it? Can I say how we minimize the dropping of leaves in our lives? If your confidence in Jesus leaks, can I tell you just a couple of ways that we can minimize that as individuals and as a church? So look at this, Hebrews 10.22. There's three different ways. The first one says this. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Then listen to this part because there's so much more here, but let me focus on this. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Sprinkled from an evil conscience. Your conscience has been covered, and it is in the process of renewal day by day by day because there is such a thing as an evil conscience. And, and you know what that conscience is? It's a conscience inside of you that says, see, see, you did it again. Did it again, you're a fraud. You know, you're sitting up here in church right now taking notes in your Bible as if. <laughs> you know what you did. It's a little voice inside of you, and the Bible says that is an evil conscience. You've been set free from that evil conscience. You don't, you don't have to listen to that evil conscience. You're not obligated to adhere to that evil conscience because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes, you know what? You need to tell your inner self to shut up. You just do. Tell it to shut up. You, you, you know, that evil conscience that says, see what you did, you know? Just tell it, to, tell it to shut up, you know? I am very aware of my performance. I'm very aware of who I am. I know my weaknesses evil conscience, you don't have to tell me about it, you know. I know I had a bad weekend, I know I had a bad day, but I know who I am because of what He has done. What He has done. My conscience is being renewed. You have no power over me. And that leads us to the second one. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. I love that word confession. I mean, sometimes 
You need to you need to open up your mouth and speak it. Confession. You need to open up your mouth and speak it. The Bible says that the that, that the the power of death and life are in your tongue. Pastor Kurt was just teaching this out of James. Power of death and life are in your tongue. Speak out what you know to be true. I'm not talking about saying stuff that's not true. Speak things that are absolutely transcendent and true, such as you're forgiven. Speak that out. You're righteous. Speak that out. You're strong. Speak that out. You're confident. You're his. He's your provider. Speak that with your voice. Say it with your words. Say it out loud. And Jesus will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Speak it out. And then the last thing it says, consider, consider how to stir one another up. Let's invent ways to encourage each other. Invent ways to build each other up. I'm not talking about patronizing. We don't, we don't patronize. We don't make stuff up, uh, saying things that aren't true, but, but things like, wow, you're, you're really strong in God. I appreciate that. I'm so encouraged every time I'm around you. I'm so encouraged. Thank you for that. Man, you know, I, you're such a blessing to me. You know what? There is no one like you. You are 100% unique. That's a Minnesota passive aggressive, by the way. You know, you are so unique. You can say that to anyone. You are so unique. <laughs> but you know what? Don't, don't forget that God has forgiven you. Don't, don't forget that you will never be more righteous than you are right this moment. I know what you did. You know, brother, I appreciate you sharing it with me. That's fine. I'm going to pray for you, but you know what? You're healed. You are whole. You're forgiven. You know, so let's move forward this week and believe for the best from God, okay? Let's do that. Wouldn't that be a different experience from what people usually get? A whole different experience when we encourage one another? You know, I know, I know not everybody loves Coach P.J. Fleck, but I was watching him yesterday. And, uh, and they are uh, Friday, I think it was Friday. Yeah, it was probably Friday, but they interviewed him after the game and, uh, and they were trying to get him to say something negative and he just wouldn't, you know, cause they just barely won that game. It was a miracle that they even won it. And, uh, and they kept asking him, what, what, uh, what, did you, what did you hope for from your team? And he said, exactly what I got. He said, those guys gave it it all. They gave it their all. They were, they were awesome. I'm so proud of them. They were, they were great. Well, what, what could they have done different? Nothing. Nothing. They won the game. They gave it their all. They poured their hearts out. They, they did exactly what I asked. Man, I appreciated that. We should be like that in the church. We should, you know? Give it your all. And instead of saying, hey, 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 you better watch out. Instead, why not say, Hey, you know what? Remember who you are. You are righteous. You are righteous. God is with you. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, as we get ready to, to close our time together today, and, uh, you know, we've got, we've got, folks here in the congregation, God bless you for coming out to the house of God. Just love being with you every week. Really do. We've got people joining online and God bless you. I appreciate you still participating and joining in with, uh, with what's going on in God's house. And, uh, and God was speaking to me in this last week. I was telling the worship team and, and all the leaders this morning when we were doing our pre-service rally. And I was saying, it's funny, God... God didn't wake me up this time, but he gave me dreams about, about this service. And, and he, he kind of told me that there was a need really to do an altar call. And, and I'll tell you, I was, going, I was going old Billy Graham, you know, Jimmy Swaggart on it. And I was having millions come to the altar. It was a different looking church, but, but uh, it was a dream, right? But, uh, but I think God was telling me that, hey, we need to, we need to, 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 to give an, an altar call. And this morning I felt, because in my dream, it was all about salvation. 
and uh, just close your eyes with me for a second. So we're not going to do an altar call where people come up. We're, uh, we're in weird days right now. But I do want to say, you know, based on the things that I have talked about this morning and that confidence that you can have in Jesus, if you don't have that, if you have never had that, I want to tell you, you could have that confidence this morning. You could have it right now. But when I said that Paul's preaching, that it was, it was easy, that people thought his preaching was too good, uh, don't forget, Paul, Paul never shortchanged what you needed to do to change your life for Jesus. It all comes through the same door, and that door is Jesus. And Jesus says, you need to repent of your sins. You need to, to bring that load of sins to him, lay it at the altar, ask his forgiveness, ask him to replace that load of sins and be the Lord of your life and to take control of your life and pledge to spend the rest of your days serving God, learning about God, growing in God, and becoming a, a believer, a disciple of Christ. That's what salvation is. And your salvation does not depend on your performance, but that doesn't mean that you don't need to take an action. You do need to take an action to give your life to Jesus. It's not on autopilot. It doesn't happen without you knowing it. You need to come to God and give your life to Him. So let me just encourage you this morning. I can't lead you through a magic prayer with all the right words, but I could tell you that you could do this on your own right now or after the service is done and give your life to Jesus. You absolutely can. So Father, I pray for anybody here or anybody that watches this today or in the future online who isn't sure and they don't know if they know you. God, I pray that they would give their hearts to you right now. Lord, we pray by the Holy Spirit right now that you would supernaturally touch them, lead them and guide them, save their souls, Father, change their lives and put them on an entirely new trajectory. God, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for changed lives. We thank you for breaking of chains, Lord, and changes of direction in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. As we close our service, worship team is going to lead us in a song.